Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, it's Johnny and welcome to Invest Like a Boss episode 45. I'm here with Sam Marks. Hey guys, hey Johnny. Yo, this, this is going to be an awesome episode. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. This is going to be a good follow-up for episode 36 with Dr. Daniel Crosby, where we talked about psychology and how much human emotion affects our investment decisions. And Johnny, I know human emotion affects a lot of our investment decisions. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's really cool that we are recording this now when the market is going up and you know it's at an all-time high because we can very kind of clearly think about what we would do the next time there is a drop. And while, and we can just always just replay this episode again and say, okay, this was the plan. This is what we talked about. This is what, you know, human emotions, what psychology is affecting us and making us act irrational. Let's take a listen to this. This is going to be a good, like you said, it'll be a good test next time we go into a recession or depression. And on this week's episode, we have Dan Egan, who is the director of behavioral finance and investments at Betterment. He's also a published author in economics and has been working in the field for over a decade. I am really excited to see how Betterment is blending technology and hundreds of years of psychology study into their modern platform to help kind of shape and curve uh, or at least play into human emotions and try to try to help us make better decisions and not emotional decisions. Definitely. And Dan's a super smart guy. He's been a guest lecturer at Ivy League universities like Columbia, uh, at NYU, UCLA, all these great places. So I'm excited to just dive in and see what he has to say about the way we think about money. Dan, welcome to Invest Like a Boss. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, man, this is a very exciting episode for us because I and a lot of our listeners have really become interested in behavioral aspects of investing. And I know when we started the podcast, it wasn't like that. It wasn't the topic that came to mind, but now it really, mm -hmm. it, it's really, it's really become kind of at the forefront of our mindset and what's going on, you know, when we're making investment decisions. And a lot of this is due to some, some of the great guests that we've had on the past. We've of course had one of your good friends, Dr. Daniel Crosby on episode 36. And mm -hmm. I just know from my own experiences that motions, whether positive or negative have caused me all of my significant losses in investing. So I'm really excited to kind of hear about your background, your profession, and how you go about applying these these uh, your expertise at Betterment. Definitely. I'm really looking forward to it too. Um, it is, it's an amazing um, sort of transformation. I remember when I was in undergraduate, I sort of came across, I don't think it was part of any curriculum, but I came across the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky on decision making and how that you know was psychology bleeding over into economics. And so I think um, I went to college in 1999. I think in 2002, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work. And when I started doing this professionally about 10 years ago, I could name one person uh, who is sort of doing applied behavioral finance and economics in the field. And now you know, it's a, it's still a small world, but it seems like it is everywhere. All of the large, um, all of the large players have somebody who is in some sort of a chief behavioral role. So, it's definitely um, happened quickly and is definitely for the better. Great stuff. And how did you actually? Did you choose this as a study, or how did you initially get into behavioral finance? Uh, it was a little bit of sort of like just a, a thing of passion. I remember being an undergrad and having to choose a major, and sort of being like, well. I like economics and I like psychology and I, I don't want to have to choose between them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up going for econ as my major and psychology as my minor. But really, you know, like in both on both sides, when I was doing the psychology stuff, you know, I, I was mostly focused on cognitive psychology. How do people make decisions? How do they go about probabilistic decisions or, you know, these sorts of how their how their emotional states influence their rationality. And the same thing from the opposite side, I was never really into macroeconomics or um, I don't know monetary theory. It was always microeconomics and decision making, and how do how do markets work when they're you know this this mass of people who all aren't perfectly rational working together. Uh, so I'd say in some ways I, I got lucky in that I was able to do that for my undergraduate, and then actually I found a program. Uh, 
called Decision Science at the London School of Economics, mm -hmm. which uh, combines psychology with game theory and statistics and a little bit of um, – a little bit of operations research, like supply chain management, and it was exactly the prop, the program that I wanted to do. It, you know, it left it open that maybe you could go into academia or maybe you could go into um, you know doing stuff in the real world, uh, and that actually was what kind of put me on the path to where I am today. That that graduate degree connected me, gave me sort of a, an advanced um, set of knowledge and how to do things. Um, I met some people through the program that got me into finance, which then allowed me to go into a behavioral finance role. Um, so I think, you know, people always ask to some degree, like, how did you do this, et cetera? And I think the answer is um, it's a little bit like catching a wave the first time you go surfing. I think I, I just got very, very lucky with various kinds of timing. And how do you and Dr. Daniel Crosby, I mentioned we had him on in episode 36, great episode. People love that. Actually, one of our two most popular episodes right now. How did you guys originally meet? I assume it's through through something in the field. Exactly. I think, uh, you know, hearkening back to, I started in an official behavioral finance role with Barclays back in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, I think the first emails I, I have from uh, Dan are around 2013, maybe a little bit earlier. And, you know, there was some point in time where uh, I think 2008, 2009, there, were, there was a grand total of, you know, four or five of us who were trying to do this as a professional role within a for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. um, so we all knew each other, you know, either you would meet up at academic conferences or just from what you were publishing and looking at, you know, there was this little cadre of people um, all trying to do the same thing who kept popping up, not as academics, but mm -hmm. as practitioners in the real world. Uh, so it's been years now. It's, it's crazy to think that, um, you know, I'm only, I'm, I'm 36 and yet it feels like you know, six years ago, 10 years ago, those are huge chunks of my life. So it's pretty interesting that you were definitely pretty deep into this stuff by the time 2007, 2008, 2009 rolled around. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm guessing that was a very impactful point in your life because you got to see a lot of what you're studying and what, what your profession has evolved into kind of going into play where you're just watching this massive geopolitical massive economic downturn happen and you're and you're watching essentially seven billion people on earth <laughs> shift to right. negative emotions right yep yeah it was a it was a you know i like to say there's only like three people who are happy when there's a market crash mm -hmm. um people who are short the market people who are permanently you know um, negative about it they're perma bears and they think we're always in a bubble and behavioral scientists mm -hmm. because that's the point in time where we get to see or at least the way i think of it is I get to see how well um, I'm able to help people in that circumstance. So being at uh, Barclays in 2007 and 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. we actually were running a longitudinal survey with our self-directed brokerage clients where we were saying, you know, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think other people think is going to happen? How are you investing? Uh, but we would go back and ask the same group of 600 people that every quarter. Mm -hmm. And so we actually just completely due to dumb luck um, had this data set that spanned, you know, pre-financial crisis, financial crisis and post-financial crisis. And we were able to see how that changed the way people looked at things, how they just extrapolated forward in time rather than, you know, nobody predicted that the market crash was coming, but after it happened, everybody was very negative about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then personally, it was really interesting because I'd been in this job for you know about about two years that was a you know one of the first applied behavioral finance rule, uh, roles in wealth management. It wasn't clear you know what we were doing from the bank's point of view. Like they came in and said, "We think there's something um, there's something here." We want you to try and help us figure out how to apply behavioral finance, but it's not like, oh, you're legal, you're compliance, you're operations, you're IT. We had to really be entrepreneurial and figure out what's the best way to use this to improve customers' outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was that was one of the more interesting things with me. We were placed within the quantitative group, and we had these incredibly smart PhDs um, who were re effectively researching how to beat the market in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And 2008 hit, and of course, like a lot of things, a lot of hedge funds and prop trading desk things blew up and didn't do very well. I still remember um, hearing about and talking about Madoff. Um, back yeah. then. And um, we were sort of off to the side in this weird little situation where we were like, we have to focus on customers. We have to focus on what's right and what's suitable for them. So I think it was, um, it was a great experience in that 
um, that insight of, you know, don't worry about markets. Markets are going to do this stuff. It's guaranteed that you're going to live through two or three crashes, um, you know, many corrections, many drawdowns through your life. Focus on what you can do to help your customers get through it and set themselves up for financial success. So strangely enough, that it kind of I think I probably believed sort of not in, in not messing around and not being an active investor too much before then. But that really cemented it into me that you can be tremendously you, you don't have to be the best. You can win wonderfully just hitting average and making sure that you don't make any big mistakes. So I just want to kind of turn some of your background into practical advice for people before we jump into betterment, which I'm dying to do and see mm-hmm. how you're applying your, your, your study there. But, you know, over the course of, of your career, all of your research and going into, you know, your profession, what do you see at a high level of how people's emotions, whether good or bad emotions, alter their investing decisions? I know that's a high level question, but I just want to give kind of everyone a little bit of a, of an overview of what, what you see in the high level of, of your research. Gotcha. So I think it's, this is a little bit of a tough one because I think we're at a, a really interesting point in time of how much that matters. Mm-hmm. As just an analogy, you know, it, maybe it used to be that how strong you were mattered for what kind of jobs you could do if you were going to be a good farmer or a good blacksmith in various things. And technology changes that relationship in that um, we now have machines that, you know, can exert far more force than a uh, a, a human being ever could. You know, it's a little bit like uh, John Henry and the steam engine. So I think throughout the vast majority of history, a lot of understanding who you were and the roles, your motivations um, played in making you make decisions well or not make decisions well, mm-hmm. a lot of it came down to a form of self-imposed self-control. Um, where, you know, you had to look at yourself and figure out how you would, um, control yourself. I think, um, religion plays a huge role here, like meditation. I actually still meditate. Um, and a lot of that is to kind of like take myself away from myself to be able to get some perspective, see how my, my emotions lead to certain behaviors that are or aren't helping me. And, at least in terms of the mental aspects of things, we're at an interesting point now where some of the most impactful insights from behavioral finance are about kind of run doing a runaround um, on those behavioral issues. So automating certain decision making or setting systems up so that you make fewer decisions in order to not have any any bad impact um, of them. But I think um, thinking from the ground up, one of the things that I've learned, which I have to admit surprised me a little bit was the degree to which genetics play a role in this. Uh, I would have said, you know, there, there's, there are no investing genes, right? There is no beating the market gene. However, there are genes um, as a constellation that seem to relate to each other that play a role in this. Uh, there are some really interesting twin studies out of some of the Nordic countries that look at whether or not environment or genetics plays a dominant role in how much risk you take in your portfolio. And, you know, so these are twins who are separated at birth or kept together. And, you know, how much does genetics versus um, environment play a role? And genetics plays a surprisingly strong role. It explains about 50% of how much risk you take. Uh, And that's a really big chunk of it. So uh, I think there's kind of a constellation of traits that work together in certain ways to make it easier for people to naturally um, save and invest well or make financial decisions well. Uh, we can go through them. We can sort of talk about them. But I want to like, you know, put it in the context of this is not fate. You know, it used to be probably like if you were a small guy, you know, you can't grow taller. You can work out. You can do various things on the margin that are going to improve um, your fitness. But, you know, if you're if you're five seven, you're five seven, and there's nothing you can do that's going to make you right. six five. That today with a lot of this stuff, it's it's much less true. I think there's lots of opportunities to take your psychological weaknesses out of the picture mm-hmm. by making more systematic decisions and using technology uh, to implement it for you. So maybe a great follow-up question for that, which I've always been personally curious about, not just in, with investing, but with success and the way people think in, in co- cognitive functions is, would you think that depending on your personality typing A versus B on the extreme ends, a certain personality type would be a better investor just straight out of the chute? Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, you know, I don't think it's A versus B. I think there's – I would get into specific kind of like personality traits um, that we tend to see. So 
Um, the ability to delay gratification, to say, um, I'm okay waiting, I'd like more later um, rather than less now, uh, that plays a big role. I think it plays a very um, like um, key role in just sort of setting up you up for budgeting and being comfortable mm -hmm. um, spending less and having enough to save. I think that the role of saving is really underestimated in this. Um, but it also is a generalized thing of like, how likely are you to need to see short term results in order to believe in long term results? Um, other elements that I think are kind of interesting is the degree to which you care about your relative position to others. Uh, and again, if you are able to go through life saying what makes me happy rather than what are other people buying, you know, to what degree do you, you know, try and keep up with the Joneses, either in terms of how much you pay for things um, or in terms of your investment performance, the more that you're blind to that, you're probably going to be a better investor because you're focused on the things that matter mm -hmm. rather than the things that don't. Um, I, you know, I, I sort of see all the time the, the worst, you know, People think that money is uh, money is the problem, and money is the source of um, of poverty. And yet, if you give people who have been poor, if they win the lottery, is basically one of the best examples. They'll generally be bankrupt and be back to being poor within five or six years. And very depressed. <laughs> exactly. And part of it is like you know a lack of that sort of ability to, to delay gratification and plan and various things. But it's also an element of. Um, you know, like looking at what other people have and, and constantly buy more. So um, have lifestyle creep over the course of your life. You know, when you get a raise, what percentage of it do you immediately start consuming versus saving? That's a really big marker uh, of how much sort of stability and the ability to last through financial shocks in your life you're, you're going to have. So the more that you kind of you don't care about what others are spending money on, you don't care about what others are doing with their portfolio. I think those things are very good predictors of how successful you're going to be. Yeah, I find it really interesting because I'm out in Tahoe right now. I just decided I never properly learned how to ski. So I'm going to go out to Tahoe. I'm going to spend a month taking lessons and skiing. And all of the lessons that I'm getting are they're teaching me. It's Skiing is really counterintuitive because the faster you go and the more steep you get and you get on the moguls eventually – you tend to want to lean back. That's, that's your mm -hmm. kind of gut is like lean back. This is dangerous, but actually you want to lean forward. You want to be on your skis. So you have to like almost trick your brain into thinking yep. that this is right. And I feel like there's a lot of parallels with that in investing because when emotions get involved, I feel like it always tells you to do what you shouldn't be doing. And I wonder from your research, would you feel like when emotions get involved, do they ever have a positive impact or is it almost always negative? Markets are down, you're scared, you run, you sell, you know, you sell at the wrong time, or you get really excited about a new hot stock, you buy, it's the wrong thing. I can, I can only relate right. to my experience, but I would think it's almost always negative. No, I think, I think we, we notice the big negative things, mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is uh, the emotions at even more of a fundamental level play a very positive role. Um, so I think that the most base motivation of fear about not having enough money and trying to figure out how to deal with that problem is a very healthy thing. Uh, I think that like anxiety about like, how am I going to pay the bills, all these things, um, you know, that is actually a dramatic step up in terms of ability to care about the future than most animals have. So planning for the future, being concerned about the future, it may be next month or next year or 30 years from now, but actually experiencing anxiety and fear about the future provokes planning action and provokes you to take steps that are actually going to help you in the long run. So I actually think that um, while it's not necessarily a pleasant thing, fear is healthy and a great motivator. And it tells you that you should be doing something. And I think that that drives a lot of good behavior in terms of trying to ask your boss for a raise or get a new job um, or figuring out how to budget in a way that lets you save enough. And then there are kind of interesting countervailing things. So one um, piece of research that we've done here we noted that, um, you know, we, we do have generally, I think generally about 95 or 90 percent of our customers um, are pretty much buy and hold investors. They're not trying to beat the market in any fashion. But then there's a subset who do, who do react to market news and, you know, increase um, their allocations or decrease the risk in their allocations. And if you're doing this in an IRA or a tax advantaged account, there's kind of no consequences of that. But if you're doing it in a taxable account, then you're going to realize capital gains if, if it's gone up and you're going to have to pay those taxes. 
And that's a good example of an explicit certain drag on your returns. Like if you make a $100 gain, but you have to pay $30 of it back in taxes, maybe you shouldn't be realizing those gains. So we build a feature here called Tax Impact Preview that, as far as I know, it's we're the only shop that does this. But where in a taxable account, if you go to change your, your asset allocation, in real time, it calculates the taxes that will be owed uh, and lets you know how much come the following April you're probably going to have to hand over mm -hmm. to the IRS. And I think that's important for two reasons. Number one, it makes you make an informed choice. A lot of the time when you're doing this stuff, you're not proactively told – Feel free to do this, but just so you know, you're going to end up paying $30 in taxes next April. So that should be part of the cold, rational decision-making no matter what. But there's a second layer here, which is an emotional reaction to taxes. And um, the fact is that a lot of people dislike taxes. In fact, <laughs> they dislike taxes disproportionate to how much taxes cost them. Uh, so uh, there's an academic who's a friend of mine, Abby Sussman, who's done some wonderful research on tax aversion. And think about this as like, how much would you pay to avoid $100 worth of taxes? There are people who will pay $102, $105, $110 to avoid $100 worth of taxes. And so here's this, uh, this kind of interesting thing that some people – are going to dislike taxes more than others. We have this feature that shows taxes to you in real time. And we said, huh, what is a general sort of feature of who you are that would predict how much you dislike paying taxes? So go ahead and guess. Jeez, I don't know. Just <laughs> hit me with it. Uh, well, you know, one really good indicator is where you fall in the political spectrum, if you're a conservative or if you're liberal. Uh, so okay, wait, 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 let me let me take another. Okay, so that, yeah, political, uh, financial earnings, of course. Yep, your tax um, rate. Um, potentially, what state you're in, which kind of goes with both. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like I would think a lot of external factors, like if you're married, if you have kids. Yep. How many kids you have? I guess you could go on and on and on. Yep. So. What we ended up saying is, okay, let's take a look at um, – say that we showed you that you would owe $50 in taxes. Mm -hmm. How likely were you to go ahead and go through with that allocation change or that transaction based upon the fact that we showed you you would owe 50 bucks? And then we looked at each individual and we tied where they lived back to the most um, – not the most recent election but the second Obama election results at a county level. So we don't know that somebody is Democratic or Republican, but we know to what degree they came from a Democrat or Republican county, right. sort of like they're a random person from there. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that there's a clear relationship there. Everybody, to be clear, everybody is less likely to go through with an allocation change if they're going to owe more in taxes. So there's a pretty nice relationship between the more tax this is going to cost you, the less likely you are to go through with it. But that's doubly true if you're very conservative, or technically, if you come from a very conservative area, compared to if you come from a very liberal area. Okay. So here's this really interesting thing. Now, from my point of view, this is good, because we have people who are probably making short-term market timing decisions, and they hate taxes more than they're worried about losing money. And so we've been able to put a little bit of an emotional break or technically an emotional, an emotional counterbalance um, against their fear of their hatred of taxes and so to actually help them not make a mistake. And this is kind of a, an interesting um, and somewhat controversial idea in the field, which is sometimes you're not trying to make people more rational. We're not trying to turn everybody into Spock. We're actually just trying to make sure that we use emotions in a good, balanced way such that people up acting as if they are very rational. Mm -hmm. But we don't necessarily have to make them cold, emotional, hyper-rational beings to do it. Hmm. Wow. And Dan, do you find – I would think this answer is very clear to a lot of people, but it got me wondering. Do you find that conservatives and liberals hate paying taxes evenly – because you would think, of course, conservatives would hate paying taxes more, but maybe liberals also hate paying taxes. They just feel like it's a better way of going about society and, and uh, finance. There's a uh, – yeah, there's an old um, an old judgment um, by – there was actually a judge, a Supreme Court judge, I think, called Judge Learned Hand, which um, is an amazing name for a judge to have. <laughs> yeah. And – 
he had a ruling that was basically about um, how much tax you should pay. And the ruling basically said you should pay as much tax as it was legally required to, for you to pay and no more. You know, that um, minimizing your taxes is perfectly legal and per- perfectly morally ethical because those are the rules of the road. And you might say, well, I think the rules should be that we pay more in taxes. But until everybody's held to those same standards, um, I'm going to not, you know, make a martyr out of myself and pay more than anybody else. So, yes, everybody, you know, dislikes um, paying taxes. I think conservatives in, in their behavior seem like they're more resistant to paying them mm-hmm. voluntarily as well. But it's not as if, um, you know, we're seeing people from liberal areas donating money to the government at <laughs> right, all. Right. Very interesting. Uh, we could go on and on and on with that forever. That could get really deep, but very uh, interesting co- topic and glad you ex- uh, expanded on it a little bit. And, you know, reading back when I was growing up and I was first starting to invest in markets, I think everyone's traditionally hit with the same information, which is invest X amount of money for the next 30 years and grow it at 8% and you'll be a millionaire. And that's all you got to do. And what I do like about Betterman, I think, is that that concept is becoming much... The ability to to follow suit in that and actually practice mm-hmm. that is becoming more of a reality. But previously, I feel like that type of advice is almost impossible to follow because things always come up in life. You go through a divorce, you have a medical condition. Like... People are always going to get out of, of investments typically in a, in a lifetime. And a lot of times that might be at the wrong time. Is that what you guys find? Because I just find that advice really hard for the average person today to follow. So I think there's a, we need to kind of, you know, break apart the motivation mm-hmm. for why you're getting out. Um, when we talk about buy and hold, we're not talking about um, put money in and never take it out. The entire point of investing is that you get to take the money out and you have way more than you would have otherwise. Mm-hmm. So withdrawing and selling is the entire point of investing. It's just that you should do it when you need the money, um, when there's a personal reason. That's very different than taking the money out because you're scared of what's going on in markets or because you mark, you think the market's going to go down soon. Uh, that's where the sort of um, the differentiation between buy and hold versus active management comes from. Um, I don't know anybody who even an active manager would say, if you're carrying, you know, you, you just, your car broke down and you needed to put $9,000 on your credit card bill would say, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, like keep investing, don't pay that off. You know, credit card interest generally at about, you know, 15, 20, 25%. That's way more than any active manager is going to be make, able to make you in a single year. So I think that everybody should be an active manager of their personal finances we should absolutely be looking for ways to increase our income, our take on pay, looking for better ways for to get tax deductions, better ways to invest our money so that it grows quicker, thinking about what insurance we might need to buy. Those are, you know, uh, here, so here's a good example. Um, I um, have a year old daughter and I am already saving up for not only her college, but also the potential, like, you know, she's going to need after daycare and everything. She's, she's, she doesn't need that yet, but I'm already saving up in advance of these things. The entire purpose of me saving that money and actually investing it is that I'm going to withdraw it, you know, in, I don't know, five years, um, 18 years max. Mm-hmm. And that's its purpose. So I think that, um, yeah, people should never feel that they're doing something wrong because they take money back out of their investments. That's absolutely what they should do. You just need to be careful about the motivation being what's going on in markets rather than what's going on in my life. So Dan, I want to jump into Betterment. And I think this is a great point. I want to just hear more about the strategy behind you joining Betterment, when that was and, and how that became uh, to what it is today. Certainly. So uh, I just passed my four-year anniversary at Betterment. I joined in about January of 2013. I've previously been at Barclays Wealth, which is a large global um, high net worth mm-hmm wealth management firm. And we'd done, that was my, my sort of first official behavioral finance job. And we'd built out a customer profiling tool and linked it to advice and investment options. 
And that was great. And I think, you know, I had an absolutely fantastic time there. I met, um, you know, some of the, the brightest people who I continue to be lucky enough to call friends today. But probably in the last two years, I'd found myself sort of coasting, um, you know, that we, we built this thing and it was working very well, but I wasn't building new things anymore. So I was actually a Betterment customer. And I, I got to the point where I was a little bit sort of like this, this could be so much better. Um, and I sat down and I wrote out, I don't know, like six things that I thought needed to be done better that would have been easy and and so on. And I actually emailed them off to the CEO, John Stein. Mm -hmm. And his reply was just something along the lines of, hey, do you want to get a coffee? And he then made a horrible strategic error and hired me. And now he pays me to send him those exact same emails um, and to work with other people here. So in Betterment, what I saw was uh, the opportunity to um, continue to build things and almost have continually building and improving things be a permanent part of my job. Uh, the ability to run randomized control trials on those changes. So to see, you know, if we do this tax impact preview feature, how is it going to change people's behavior? How do we know that we're helping them? How can we empirically test that assumption? Uh, and being able to have that feedback loop to improve the quality of advice. And also just the, the technology was really exciting, right? And here's, you have the ability to do things that can't be done. Um, if you're a human being, or that can't be done cost effectively for most people. Uh, so it was a, a very exciting change for me. I'm very curious to know what your average day is like, because I feel like at Betterment, I look at it kind of almost like the, at this, as this massive lab. And I used to have a startup uh, eight years ago that was a platform and portal for for hotels. And every day you could sit back and just analyze so much data and so much consumer behavior that it was like it was like being a, a mad scientist in a lab and i can only imagine what you have at betterment is insane so i'm really curious to know what your typical day looks like and also what your team looks like i believe you have a, a great team under you as well uh they're a beautiful team the best team the most beautiful team ever no. <laughs> um, they're uh so yeah i mean a lot of my days are um you know like i I have a little bit of customer interaction. Um, I sort of hold out and still enjoy emailing and talking to customers when there's a specific case that comes up. Um, and so I quite like, you know, kind of going down and interacting with our customer service team and doing that. Um, a lot of planning and strategy around uh, what services should we deliver? So I joined better when I joined Betterman, I was about an employee number 20 and we're now at about 220 and we've moved away from me being responsible for writing code and doing these things to people who are really much better at it doing those. And so now it's a little bit more, um, okay, what are we doing over the next six months or one year? What are the strategic advances that we need to be doing? And what role does consumer psychology play in them? What role does, like, what are the most effective things we can do to help people? Uh, so a lot of it's bigger picture, thinking about the proposals, thinking about the details of the implementation of those things. Um, and I get to work with a combination of specialists of various stripes that are far better at, you know, their aspect of things than I am. So it's been, I think I've been responsible for hiring about eight people here at this point. Most of them very quantitative. All, all of our investing team are quants that write code, um, do the analysis in-house themselves. Um, we've built an in-house Monte Carlo testing engine to see like if we can test strategies about how they're going to perform over time. And we don't have anybody who, you know, locally with the team who doesn't code. It's a, it is, you know, it's a little bit like being in a, I don't know, some kind of algorithmic hedge fund group, except that we're not trying to beat the market. We're trying to improve taxes and fees and take home returns of various kinds. I was going to ask what the, the skill set is of the people you hire, but it sounds like they're basically people with good mathematics background and, and some type of engineering skills. Yep. Uh, and finance. Um, finance. I think, you know, a good understanding of how financial markets work is really a key part of it. Uh, we have a, a capital markets team who's responsible for how, how do we go out and trade? You know, Betterment is now at just under $8 billion and we continue to grow very quickly. Um, when every day we are one of the biggest participants in some of the ETFs that we trade, we need to be careful about not being the, the fat guy splashing around in the tub. So there's a, a variety of disciplines from capital markets and execution to backtesting and statistics um, that all come together. And another element of the team that's really cool is that we work with um, a number of certified financial planners who look at tax and estate planning and insurance and various things and say, 
we, we look for a lot of these opportunities to, you know, I think people don't usually think about your investment advisor as being the person who's telling you, you should have a Roth or a traditional IRA, but that's a lot of what we do mm -hmm. because it's so ignored. And yet the benefits of getting that right are huge and certain. Whereas the benefits of trying to call what the market's going to do tomorrow um, is pretty small and very uncertain. So we are kind of trying to do things a little bit like, um, I don't know, perpendicular to how most existing investment advisors work. I read on your, your LinkedIn, it was very simply written and I loved it. It says, I use behavioral finance to help people make better financial decisions. I believe we can use technology and design to make optimal investing effortless. And the key word there for me was design, because when I think of Betterment, everyone thinks of a website, which is one of the reasons it's great to have you guys on the show, because you hear about the team that's behind it. It's not just a platform. It's not just a website. There's this, this great team behind it. But the word design kind of caught my eye and interest. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you use behavioral psychology to improve design elements and the user experience when they log into Betterment? Sure. It's a funny thing. Uh, so we have in what I would consider a quote unquote real designers um, in house who um, make it very usable and very pretty. And I sort of think about it as designing decisions uh, and designing things um, that help people to make better decisions. So I'm going to, to take a little tangent here and talk about the Save More Tomorrow program. Mm -hmm. And the Save More Tomorrow program uh, was a test that was done in the 1990s that had to do with helping people save more in 401k plans. Now, the, the federal government already made 401k plans tax exempt. It's cheap for employers to put money into 401k plans. They get tax deductions. The employees get tax deductions. And uh, But these sort of economic incentives didn't seem to be spurring a lot of um, – of saving into these account types that so you generally saw participation rates around 10 or 20 percent of the workforce and save more tomorrow said well like maybe this isn't about a sort of super rational and firm choice people are making maybe this is just like bad design of you have to fill out these forms and it's onerous um, so what they did is they said we're going to run a little experiment um we're going to change the default. The default is you are not saving in this plan. And we're going to change the default to be you are saving in this plan. And you can opt out. It's dead simple. You just tick a box and you're not going to be part of the 401k plan. You don't have to save anything. But by default, you will be saving. And when they implemented that, they saw new um, employee participation rates jump to 80%. So here was this thing that, you know, we sort of thought people were making a decision when actually it was that they weren't making a decision that was causing participation rates to be so low. They then said, well, you know, sometimes people can't afford to save that much initially and they don't want to give up their consumption. You know, like if you, if you start saving, it usually means you start spending less. So they implemented another part of it, which is auto escalation. So every year when you get a raise, um, it automatically takes 50% of that raise and puts it towards your savings. Mm. So you never actually consume less. You're never spending less, but you save more at an accelerated rate. These two elements have a, a lot of psychology behind them in terms of the defaults and the fact that you sort of discount the future, but you don't mind it when it happens because you're still you, – you never feel a reduction in how much you're spending. Right. So that's an example of um, design of the way the system works that understands how human psychology works that results in better outcomes for all of the employees. That kind of insight, how do we design this system so that most people end up in a good spot and end up being successful without having to make a lot of decisions? That's the role that I play. I love it. Very well said. And that kind of leads into what might be on a lot of people's minds, which is what happens in the next big recession or the next big down market? Because I imagine when the markets are up markets right now, all time highs for the most part, everyone's happy. <laughs> Everyone seems happy. And I'm sure things are probably pretty quiet at Betterment when, when the markets are up. People, there's a lot, probably less activity in the site, except for people maybe logging in and, and, uh, sm cracking a smile at their gains. But what happens and how does Betterment plan around a next big potential financial crisis? How do you guys plan to curb people's emotions so they don't get out at the wrong times? Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, and I think one element to, of it, you know, I, that I'm on the inside and I've been here for four years. So I kind of have a bit of experience that makes me uh, more optimistic about than I think I would be if I were on the outside. 
so every time there's been a market correction, which is a drop in the market of 10% or more, there have actually been about four or five of those um, as long as Betterment's been around. Mm. So while it is true, it's always true that the general trend of the market is up, it's not as if we haven't had some pretty serious speed bumps along the way. Every time one of those happens, we have definitely convened. Uh, we have a, a little downturn management um, team mm -hmm. that you know is key players from different parts of the business. And we pull together and we say, okay, um, what are we going to do that we know works? And what are we going to try new this time? And that started four years ago. Uh, I believe it was either the Greek crisis or the taper tantrum when they thought quantitative easing was going to end. The market dropped pretty significantly. And we said, well, we're going to try emailing our customers and telling them to stay the course. And so we did a randomized control trial of putting people into a treat. There were three different treatment groups and there was a control group. And we sent out this email saying stay the course. And then we studied the results of what people actually did. So rather than saying, well, we just should do this, we were able to have an empirical approach. And that actually taught us that emailing everybody was too broad. It was too much of a shotgun approach. We needed to be more surgical. We were actually causing anxiety to people who had not been paying attention to it. Uh, so we moved from emailing everybody to targeted pop-up notifications only if you logged in during one of these um, downturns, which increased our effective hit ratio pretty, pretty well. So... We've had, I think, four or five of these. The last one was actually during the election. Um, people were very, uh, very worried that the election was going to lead to a market crash. And we now have a playbook that literally uh, we look at people's login rates, asset allocation change rates, what's going on in the news, what the returns of U.S. markets and other markets are. And one of the refrains that people hear from me a lot is that we should have basically a systematic process for making these decisions. And that is part of how we do things internally. We have this playbook that says, if these things, then this. If these things, then this. How much do we escalate it? How, you know, what are the behaviors that we're actually seeing? And because we have these four or five historical things that, you know, are, are, are not the, you know, they're not a 2008 size crash at all, but they let us know, you know, they, they allow us to kind of calibrate what's happening there. I know that it's going to be, it's not, it's not going to be as bad as people think. Um, we have the people who choose to use Betterment are not active traders for the most part. They are buy and hold long-term people. They've chosen us for a reason. In nowhere in our marketing does it say, you know, we guarantee that you're never going to have, never going to experience losses and these sorts of things. So I think that our customers naturally are going to be a good fit to stay the course during a downturn. Makes sense. I was immediately what I was thinking when you were talking about that stuff and you nailed it right on the head was I would almost think that you can gauge people's anxieties just by tracking how many times they log in each day or especially in a down market and then curve certain information, maybe historical data or whatever to the people that you gauge are having a lot of anxiety at that moment. Yeah, I think there's there's kind of a couple of different approaches. One is it's interesting. There are people who just log in all the time. So those people are not sensitive to it. You almost need, you know, canary in the coal mine people who almost never log in, but do when they're getting stressed. And if you can tag those people and monitor their login rates, you can get a pretty good stress indicator. Uh, we have a feature which has proved really, really helpful with this. If you talk to, if you read sort of almost any like how to become a good investor book, they talk about decision journaling, which is when you're going to make a decision, you write down, like think about you're buying a stock and say, I am buying this stock because the PE is really low and I expect this to go up. And you talk about when you're going to sell. You basically journal this decision to try and give yourself a framework for your decision at that point in time. We actually do something like that and we're able to see what percentage of people are changing their allocation because they think the market is going to go up or they think the market is going to go down. Um, so, you know, to your point earlier about being buy and hold, when somebody is taking money out because they need to repair their car, we know that that's the motivation they're taking money out. And we don't confuse it with they're taking money out because they think the market's going to go down. Um, so we, we do have a pretty good feel for the motivations that people are bringing to the table of those decisions. Gotcha. I have one more question before we kind of start summarizing the episode, Dan, is regarding for buy and hold investors. And we talked about this, just Johnny and I, in the last couple of episodes, just trying to get our own thoughts straightened out. Some people are thinking that uh, there's you know a big correction coming. And I was thinking along the lines of just our personal investing, really, we should be excited for those types of of, of market 
kind of uh, rebalancing, right? Because if the if the market goes down 15, 20, 30 percent, and we're buy and hold, we're in this for the long term, we don't need any money now. That's actually a good thing for us because we dollar cost average at lower prices if we're reinvesting the dividends. That That's kind of my takeaway over the last few episodes. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Uh, I think that's a, a comforting way of thinking about it. I think I'm going to disagree with you just because I worry that it can. it's a, a good fable that can be taken too far. I would say that the right place for most people to be in is to be indifferent about market drops. Uh, they should neither be excited by, by them nor worried about them uh, on either side because they should be taking on the right amount of risk that allows them to be that kind of calm and different towards it. And you know the potential harm that I see in people thinking about waiting for dips in dollar cost averaging is that people have actually they sort of done that. They said, I'm going to stay on the sidelines until there's a dip so that I know I'm not buying at, the, at a high. And the fact is that markets can stay high and go even higher for very long periods of time. Um, so I'd say that, you know, as you know, if you're dollar cost averaging because you get paid bi-weekly and you put money in bi-weekly, that to me is that's the perfect strategy because you're getting the most amount of time possible in the market. You know, that's the there's one kind of market timing I support, and that's the most amount of time possible. On the other hand, I would say you should not wait for a dip. Um, I don't think that there is like, you know, if you're waiting to dollar cost average for something to go down, you can actually the, the whole thing is that you miss out on like lots and lots of the market going up because, um, you know, to your point earlier, the market is only in ever in two set of states. It's either at an all time high or it's in a drawdown from that high. Huh. It can only be one of two things. And on average, markets go up. So by definition, it's going to spend most of its time in all time highs. Um, so it's something that we sort of forget is that, you know, markets are meant to go up on time. That's okay for them to hit new records. That's actually a sign of them functioning correctly. Lots of great stuff in there. I really like the quote that you said about the only type of market timing that I support is total market timing or being in the market as long as possible. That's great. Um, just a couple of questions on closing or actually not questions, but just to kind of summarize mm -hmm. the word on the street is betterment's growing a lot. You just mentioned some of the, the, the amounts that you have under management now, which from the last time we talked about betterment has increased. Um, I think you're growing a lot faster than your peers. You don't have to confirm that, but if it was the case and, and just because we know betterment's been growing so well, what do you think that you guys are doing so well internally that, uh, that maybe some of your peers are not? Yep. I, I went out and confirmed it. Um, we, I, I, I tend to not pay attention to it, but we apparently have been growing faster than our peers year after year. Um, we're at just under $8 billion. Um, I have to admit, I was on vacation last week and I came back in and I went, wow, that's gone up quickly. Uh, so it's a, a little bit surprising for us as well. Um, I think there are a few things that have to do with it. Um, you know, the ability to have goal-based wealth management. Some of our competitors don't actually have a full goal-based wealth management interface. That goes a long way to helping people plan for multiple goals and that helps them gather their own assets quicker. Uh, I think that our investment in various kinds of financial planning advice, uh, like retire guide and individual savings things, has helped people um, get to the right place that they're comfortable getting advice from us. Mm -hmm. And then we really uh, kind of knock the ball out of the park, I think, on a number of the tax related features. So uh, we do tax loss harvesting uh, just, uh, I think, about six months ago. We launched a service called um, Tax Coordinated Portfolios, which does asset location, uh, sort of does long-term tax management across your IRAs, your 401ks, and your taxable accounts, which is a, a super, you know, coming from a high net worth um, wealth manager, that's something that they're, they're used to doing, and they're used to doing um, – manually with human beings that we wrote an algorithm that does it for them. Uh, so those are things that, you know, I really like about Benrent that when we build these things that help our customers save and grow their money faster, it's good for us as well. I think those have definitely all contributed. And then, of course, we have a couple of really uh, exciting new things. Last year, we launched our 401k service, um, Betterment for Business, so that uh, employees and companies can have 401ks using our platform as well. Um, that's done 
surprisingly well. It's growing very well, and we're incredibly happy for it because that's the bulk of where most Americans are going to have their retirement savings. Mm -hmm. uh, we just launched the fact that we um, offer human advice. If you want to get financial planning advice from us over the phone, we can do that using our own certified financial planners. Or, and this is one of the really cool things, you can use a network of financial planners who have been vetted and approved by Betterment. So this is a little bit um, turning uh, Betterment into the Uber of financial planning and investment management where you don't necessarily have to use you know, us as your financial planner. You can use anybody from this uh, national network of financial planners. Mm. We're just going to be the technology underlying it. Very cool. Very cool. Man, Dan, this is super interesting stuff. I, I know you blog for Betterment. Is there any other way that we can stay on top of more of what you research and what your findings are and, and what you write about? Yeah, sure. So my Twitter handle is at Daniel underscore Egan. Okay. Um, that's a, my personal one. And then my personal website is dpegan.com. Okay. Um, and that's, that's, you know, probably going to skew more towards, uh, philosophy and behavioral finance thing than tax strategies. Uh, oh, I love that stuff. Personal musings. These are all things that were not interesting at all when we started the podcast and have become probably my clear favorite thing to talk about because I just think it's so deep and so analytical and so fascinating. So thanks, Dan, for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun and we're looking forward to sharing this with the listeners. Wonderful. My pleasure. Take care. That was super interesting and it's got me thinking a lot about the way I think about money. Yeah, it's great to know that Betterment is thinking about these things and that they're hiring top talent. I think Dan is probably one of the top, most talented guys in the field. And to know that he's working at Betterment, thinking about these things, just how much data that they can process and how they, they can understand these things they might be able to, you know, in a sense, understand the stuff better than anyone else out there just because of how much money they're managing, how many accounts they're managing and, and how much data that they're able to absorb. I thought it was really cool that you, you kind of brought up what I think a lot of us are thinking that when we look at a website, we just assume you know, it's a website with some programmers behind it. But in reality, there's a whole team of people like Dan that we never really even think about. You know, we never think about, I mean, how people will use it and, and not just with, you know, user experience, like, can I find the checkout button or can I, you know, can I find these buttons? But, you know, what it, what it kind of, um, points people at. And I, I think a great example was the fact that they completely messed up when they sent out, like, um, don't panic emails to everyone and even though most people weren't panicking and it's cool that they had people like dan see that and be like you know what that was a terrible idea let's only send it <laughs> to people who have actually logged in and are displaying panic tendencies yeah and i also think it's a good move that betterment has launched their call service where you can actually call and and speak to a quote-unquote advisor and i say quote-unquote because i know advisor is kind of a four-letter word to a lot of listeners but i think it's a good move for the company and it's a good direction to let people feel like, okay, Betterment is more than just a robo-advisor. It's more than just a platform of technology. There are actual people behind it. There's actual financial proficient people, and there's also psychological people and lots of other different types of fields that you would never imagine were part of a robo, a, a traditional robo-advisory, especially with this new age where these things are popping up and we don't know that much about them. To allow people to call and have personal contact with different professions, I think is a really good move. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a great idea on their part, especially to capture people who, you know, maybe our parents' age, who are just used to talking to someone, used to walking in and you know, that's something that makes them feel assured that their money is safe. While our mm -hmm. generation, I feel safer if there's not a single person touching my, you know, with access to my account where it's an online platform where pretty much nobody has access and that no one person is telling me what to do or not to do. Everything is based on my own research online or, you know, what I've learned through this podcast or do my own research, reading books and things like that. I agree totally. And, you know, the, the term discretionary account is the the name and terminology used for someone who has discretion over your account, meaning that they can make trades on behalf of you. And that's how I got burned in the past was allowing someone to make trades on my behalf because, I you know, they're the financial advisor. I thought that, that that's what, what they do and that they beat the markets and they didn't. And I essentially lost money over the course of three years when I could have made tons and tons of money if I just been the market. So for now, for me, all I want to do going forward is be the market. If the market's up 8% historically, I'm happy with 8%. I don't need 12%. I don't need 15%, 30%. I'll make that in my risky stuff, which is my own investments and investing in myself. So 
I'm happy if I can be the market. If the market's up, I'm happy to know that I don't need to look at my account. I know I'm going to be up. And if the market's down, there's no surprises. I know if, if the market's down, I'm going to look in my account. It's down. But what I don't like is not knowing and then having all these surprises. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. And I, and I really believe that it's in Betterment's best interest to keep everybody – making money and you know obviously they can't control the stock market but what they can do is have guys like Dan you know set up um you know things even some of the things like you know email pop up saying you know mm-hmm. here is the historical you know historical data or here's an email with some more information about why it's probably better for you to you know to consider you know holding the stock until it goes back up and selling everything in a panic right now and things like that, I, th- I think, are really going to not only benefit individual users, but the company as a whole, because I think the next time there is a downturn, and, and there has to be a downturn, there, there's never, mm-hmm. it's, it's never going to go up forever, right? It's always going to be some kind of correction. And this is going to be the first big downturn of the robo advisors age. And I don't want, you know, I think that one of their biggest fears is people will lose, it, you know, confidence in robo advisors and blame the robo advisor if their money goes down even though it has nothing to do with them and they're just a vehicle i'm very curious also to see how they'll how they'll handle that and a lot of what dan's doing day to day will come into play i think a lot of what he's doing and his team's doing on a daily basis is somewhat irrelevant when markets are at all-time highs people are either logging in and and happy that you know that there's a lot of green and, and more money in their account but when markets go down, what happens, you know, and I think so I think what they're building, there's a lot of kind of full proofs and safe checks in place for that next correction. So I'm actually really excited. And um, I would be love to pick Dan's brain next time that we do go into a downturn and see, see just what what's happening at Betterment, you would imagine that when markets hit all time highs, it's probably really quiet over there. And when markets start taking a dip, the phones start ringing, emails start going, logins start, you know, <laughs> tripling, quadrupling. So it'll be, uh, it'll be cool to, to be able to, to talk to them after and see how, how everything was handled. I'm actually kind of looking forward to what our podcast episodes will be like during the next downturn. <clears throat> I think <laughs> <laughs> the, the tone is definitely going to change. Uh, it's going to be exciting and, but it's good that, you know, we have, you know, these f- 45 episodes during a upturn. Where mm-hmm. you know everything is you know gravy, everyone's happy, everyone's optimistic, and it's going to be exciting to see that. One thing that I wish that you know companies like Betterment or, or other robo advisors would do is have some kind of contract that we can opt into. You know, don't make it a requirement because some people, a lot of people, won't like it. But for people like me, I would love for me to you know just self opt into something and say, do not let me sell when the market is down, or only let mm-hmm. me sell. Four percent per month, you know, um, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, while the market is down, and have that be something that you know, I voluntarily go into, knowing that, hey, if something, ha- you know, if the market goes, goes down, there's a chance I might panic, and I might want to, you know, sell sell everything, even though I shouldn't, <laughs> and. But, you know, having this contract in place, it just kind of forces my money to stay there, and if if I if I bitch about it, they can just pull up the contract and say, hey, you the one that wanted to do this. This is your plan. You have to stick to it. I think that's really cool and good insight. And it's almost a lot of things that you and I do on the internet. You know, we're familiar with the term two-step authentication, right? Where a lot of times when you have to log in, you need two or three different types of, of checks and security points. So maybe if, if that would be a good step in the right direction for them is say, okay, before we go into just totally locking your account based on a contract, we're going to make you do these three steps, which is you have to submit this, which is like sign document, scan, send it in. You have to call and talk to an advisor. And then you have to do this this little like 20, 20 minute survey or something that forces you out of uh, to sell your. But to make to kind of take that step, because, again, that's that's what we're talking about with Daniel Crosby. And on this episode and a lot of other episodes we touched on our emotions and how it's so easy to make trades right now. It literally takes seven seconds to log into my E-Trade account and make a trade. And that's too fast. Like that has never worked out to my advantage. Either I'm jumping in and buying something because I'm super excited and, and optimistic and that is not ever <laughs> been good for me or I'm doing the opposite. I'm a mess. I'm emotional. Something, you know, happened financially or personal life. I just want to sell or I turn on the TV and everything's red. I want to sell 
that's never been a good thing for me. Immediate access to being able to trade has never benefited me once. So putting in some type of detour would be a very beneficial thing in my financial investing life. Yeah, definitely. And even something as simple as like opting in to a 24 hour cooling off period or something saying, Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Don't let me sell right away. Remind me again in 24 hours and ask me if I still want to sell. I think things, even something small like that would be easy. I, you know, I understand why maybe they don't have it in place because they don't want the freaking, you know, uh, Fox News to start having headlines like, you know, Betterment is locking people out of their money, you know, even, and then just totally, not mentioning the fact that this is something that people opt into optionally because you know while they're in a good space. So, I think it's interesting. I think this the whole human psychology element of investing is interesting and I actually thought it was really cool that he disagreed uh when you when we had mentioned that we we're hoping for a downturn. And I think he's right. I think we really should just be indifferent about it. We shouldn't just mm-hmm. hope for the next downturn because that might prevent us from putting money in today and i've been a little bit guilty of this while this you know the stock market is, is high even my three thousand dollars i'm putting into vti or um into vanguard every single month sometimes i'm reluctant and thinking oh maybe i should skip this month or maybe i should um do a mm-hmm. you know uh, a buy order for something a little bit lower so that if it doesn't kick in then oh well but he is right you know the the best market timing really is your total amount of time in the market Yep. And like Dr. Daniel Crosby said, the best type of investing is boring investing. So I think it's all starting to mesh well for us together. And, uh, and this has been, you know, one of the, the beauties of the podcast is, and, and like me saying on that episode that I, I'm, I should really be looking forward to a market downturn and he disagreed. I think that's great because that is just balanced me. Whereas before I was like, okay, I'm, I'm only looking forward to, market highs. And then I was like, well, actually, if I'm a long term investor, I should be looking forward to, you know, to recessions and, and corrections. And now I'm kind of back in the middle where I'm, I'm just balanced. I'm kind of agnostic. I'm just I'm just happy to be participating in the market in a smart way and trying to keep emotions out of it as much as possible. I do like that. And I also like that he brought up the fact that it's better to be passive when it comes to investing but active when it comes to personal expenses and growing our income mm-hmm. because i think neither you or i would be in a place where we can even invest money if we didn't uh number one bootstrap our businesses and keep our expenses low and then second you know work our our butts off to grow and sell those businesses so we can have money to invest yep rule number one invest in yourself educate yourself travel network start something hustle do what you got to do yeah definitely and you know if you want to know more about you know, I, I think I'm wondering how many people listen to this, this show started from episode one. I know a lot of people have messaged in, um, said it in the, in their reviews or just, you know, otherwise, uh, let us know that they started listening to whatever episode and then they went back to episode one and listened to all of them through. And I think right now it's still pretty relatively easy because it's only 45 episodes. Um, but mm-hmm. if you know, if you guys want to know kind of more about how we worked on ourselves, um, Episode one was all about Sam's uh, journey. Episode two was mine. And then I think we did one called 300xing your, your, return. your investment. Yeah. yeah. And that was episode 23. Uh, that was my story and how I went from, I don't want to say zero, but you know, for like less than a couple thousand dollars to where I am today, which is, I just calculated it over half a million. Good for you, buddy. Good for you. Thank and you, yeah, buddy. I would, see, I think episode one and two are they're good kind of introductions to who we are. But that episode twenty six with you on the three hundred times your return, that's really who you are. You know, that's how you got here. And I think a lot of a lot of my favorite episodes are actually, you know, some of the early ones, the, the you know, ten to twenty. Um, but the the show didn't really get really popular until after about episode 20. So a lot of people didn't even start listening until, you know, episode 20, 30, 40. So make sure you go back and look at some of those previous episodes. And dude, we're going to have to do another follow-up episode with your uh, your journey from 100,000 to, to half a million. That's a, that's a big mark. Congratulations. I appreciate that. I, I wish there was a word for it. I wish I could start calling myself like a hot half millionaire, by bi- bi- uh, millionaire. That, that, <laughs> that would just be so cheesy at, at the bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know Johnny F. He's like a half millionaire. You know? Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait till you get to the million. It's not too far away. Oh, I, pre- I appreciate your, your your supporting me and, and thinking of that. Uh, if you guys haven't actually listened to episode 22, that we actually had the 
the CEO of Betterment on John Stein. And that, that is a great insight on what robo investing actually is and kind of the, some of the pros and cons of it. Cause, uh, as always, Sam and I break it down afterwards and put in our own personal opinions. Uh, so definitely listen to episode 22 if you haven't already. Indeed, I've enjoyed that episode. And just thanks to Betterment for coming back on again. I, you know, now we're getting into this, this loop where we've had great episodes with a lot of these companies. Now they're coming on to do kind of another deep level of, de- of uh, detail and analysis with us. So we're starting to really get in deep to these companies and learn more about their, their personnel, their employees, what they're, what they're focusing on on a daily uh, basis and some of their internal operations, which is really, really cool insight to see how these companies that are essentially researching what you and I are researching each week on this podcast are thinking about and what they're doing to improve returns for their investors. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, you know, uh, you know, by working for Betterment, he's going to be biased towards, you know, you staying with them and, um, and making more money with them. But the nice thing is their goal and to, for them to make more money is for you to make more money as well. So it's kind of, you know, even though there is that always going to be that bias, at least it's a line on your side. Agree totally. So Johnny, how do we summarize yeah. this week's episode? So I think the big takeaways that, that I got out of it is one is time of money. I mean, <laughs> amount of time in the market is the best market timing. Second mm-hmm. is delaying gravi- gratification is one of the biggest keys to success. And the third is by not making a decision, you have to realize you're not not making a decision, you're you're deciding whatever the, the default is. So don't let others have that power. You have to have the information. You have to take the action to either opt in or out of whatever choice you have in life, especially with business and investing. Dude, that was really poetic and beautiful. I love that. <laughs> I would say for me, it was just a reflection on uh, a, take, a big takeaway that's always stuck with me from the Meb Faber episode, which was basically take off for summer like just and he's a surfer so he's just like you know what stop over analyzing just put it and just take off for summer uh and for me it kind of just reflects on that it's just it's just don't overthink about things betterment is putting in millions and millions and millions of dollars and hiring the top talent to research and understand this stuff and to not try to beat the market to just try to be the market in the smartest way possible put your money in have a strategy set it and forget it and that's exactly what i'm doing i'm literally in Bali right now and I just got done spending the whole week on the waves surfing or at least trying to surf. So that's been my 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 journey this week with investing. Beautiful. Uh, likewise, I'm on the opposite side of the world of you, but I've been hitting the slopes in Tahoe doing some spring skiing. I am totally roasted head to toe, but uh, it's been a great time and been watching those dividends come in and it's been a it's been a nice feeling markets high markets low doesn't matter i have a strategy so one thing we actually didn't m- mention that i'm i'm curious on your point of view on just from a business uh you know business growth point of view why do you think that betterment is growing so much faster than than the other robo advisors i i have i have a a, a big idea on that i've given this a little bit of thought and the the best the best line that i can communicate actually comes down to communicate communications and what i'm seeing from a lot of these companies who are like peer street fundrise betterment i mean there's some of the best companies that i've had a personal experience and i'm not talking about hey i'm sam from invest like a boss i'm talking about as an investor as a nobody talking to their customer service talking to different people in their organization it's been a really, really good experience. And I think that all stems down from the top and from a, an overall strategy and overall management. And when you, when your customer service, your customer service, I think a lot of companies don't realize how important customer service is, and especially in a day of age when we always are on this show, Bash and pa- PayPal and, and some other companies. But we're in a day and age where customer service crap has become the standard. And when you get a really, really above average beating your expectations type of customer service experience that is driven from the top down. That is driven from the company culture, from the management, from the, uh, the investors and whoever else is involved in the company. That's a, that's a strategy. And I think when, when people put that in place, 
they're just a good company all around that are thinking about that those things and the end customer communication. Uh, and that's been my experience with some of these companies that we've had on the show that have grown super fast, like Betterment, above of its peers. And I, I can tell you f- firsthand that Betterment's overall touch point experience has been v- vastly superior to other companies in in the same category. I can definitely see that. And I think in this day and age where any random customer that calls in has access to Twitter or other social media where every single minute that they are on, a, on hold and unhappy, that's another minute they can tweet and just spread the word about how crappy your customer service is. Mm. You know, and if you look at my Twitter, Johnny FDK, it's half of it is me, you know, on hold bitching about Bank of America being a piece <laughs> of shit, you know, PayPal being a piece of shit or, you know, any of these other companies that just put you on hold forever for no freaking reason when People like me are tech savvy enough where we are happy to fix our own problems. Just give us access to do so online. And, you know, I understand there's always going to be a few people who, even though, you know, you can make, you could change your reservation online, uh, they'll call it anyways. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, you know, maybe there's something you could do about that, but I guarantee you, you'll 90% of people are ha- much happier to change something online, even if, we have, even if we have to pay for it, than have to call in. Yeah. So do you think that that – is that your idea of how Betterment is improving over its peers? I, that's something I didn't uh, consider. The, the My point of view is as a customer of, of both, I realized that the only reason why I signed up for Wealthfront is because they had free uh, management for up to you know the first – however amount like uh, i don't even remember what it was now maybe mm-hmm. 30k or something uh okay. and my account now has 34k in it because i'm a cheap ass and i'm like well i only get 30k for free <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna put any more money in versus mm-hmm. with uh betterment they encourage you to put more and more money into your account because the higher the more money you have in there the lower the fees are so if you have anything over a hundred thousand dollars with betterment the fees are you know, super low, you know, you, you, I think you're in the highest bracket where the, the percentage is, is, you know, something almost insignificant. And mm-hmm. that encourages a different type of customer. And that, that type of customer, you know, usually in, in general, you know, the kind of the high tier customers, the high quality customers, uh, they have less questions. They have less complaints. Um, you know, they just, they just put their money in there and you have less to maybe total customers. Even I, I would almost be willing to bet that. Just based off of this and nothing else, I would be willing to bet that Betterment's average account value is higher than the other ones just because it encourages people to want to level up and put more money in while people like Wellfund, it almost discourages that. It almost makes us want to keep less and less money in there. Mm, That's a really good synopsis. Uh, I haven't ever actually thought about that, you know, because I think coming from where I was with 1%, I was actually paying one and I don't know, between one and 1.5% with an actual advisor going to 0.25% was like nothing. But now I know a lot of people that are using robo advisors and, or also may manage their own, uh, asset allocation, maybe via Vanguard or another fund manager a lot of people are like, like 0.25%, 25 basis points. That's, that's crazy. Like I'll just manage it myself in Vanguard. But still from where I came from, 0.25% is nothing. But getting down to 15 basis, is, uh, 15 basis points from 0.25 to 0.15, you know, over the course from everything we've learned, Paul Merriman and a lot of other episodes, that over the course of, you know, 30, 40 years of investing, that is a significant amount of money. Yeah. Definitely. So if you guys did want to invest with Betterment, you can use our link. It's investlikeaboss.com slash Betterment. That way it gives us credit for referring you. Uh, as And if there's anything else you guys ever want to sign up for, see if you have a link. Just go to investlikeaboss.com, click on the resources, and that way you can help support the show and keep us doing these great episodes with these amazing guests. Uh, and also, a uh, big thank you to everyone who's taken the time to leave these amazing five-star reviews of the podcast on the iTunes store. You guys are the reason why we're able to get these big-name companies, including you know the CEOs of these businesses, to keep coming on the show. So this week, uh, we have a, a review by Greg All Day. Very inspirational. Got me out of my seat. Five stars. These guys really helped educate me in the world of investing. 
I never knew or even considered alternative investments before Sam and Johnny brought it to my attention. And now I have a plan to invest. I've already acquired a substantial amount of Vanguard VTI and my next motivation will be Pure Street. Though I'm still a bit out of debt, I'm re-strategizing my debt in a way that could possibly get me out of debt quicker. I suggest listening to these guys because they definitely speak to my generation. Just turned 30. Cheers, guys. And I'd like to hear more whiskey recommendations. <laughs> well, he's taking VTI, your strategy, Johnny. Yeah. And, you know, Pure Street, which is both of ours. So, um, mm-hmm. Oh, you'd hopefully be on board with that. And, and it, it is interesting. I'm, I'm curious what he's doing about getting out of debt quicker. I, maybe we should have an episode on getting people out of debt or restructuring debt. That we should. Might be interesting. We should. A lot of people have asked for that. Yeah. We'll, we'll find an expert. We, we promise we'll find someone to, uh, to bring on to do that. I know a lot of people have asked for that. And just to comment on, on Johnny's, uh, mentioned about the reviews. This is how we get these great guests, but also this is the reason that Johnny and I do it. I mean, of course, Johnny and I are learning tons. And as you just heard, Johnny just broke a new financial milestone. And I, you know, a lot of that's through investing in yourself, but I'm sure a lot of that is also through what you've learned on the podcast. And, you know, th- these reviews are the reason, I mean, that, that's our morale. That's why, that's why we're doing it, is to continue to to help and um, help ourselves and, and help our audience. And if it wasn't for you guys, if no one was listening and getting value out of this, we'd probably stop doing it pretty quickly. So keep the reviews coming. That's how we get guests on. And that's how, um, that's how we continue uh, gearing up for this each week, week in and week out. Yeah, definitely. So thanks again. And I'll see all of you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.